Well, good morning. Today is, uh, is it the first? Good afternoon, I mean. I'm better in the morning. Um, a lot better. Um, here I am bringing up the rear again. Uh, same thing last year. Chuck, I, I've got a question for you. I'm sure you're waiting for this. How come you sent me two invitations? I couldn't tell you. No, you did. You sent me the first one. I was going to be the second speaker. And the last one, I'm the speaker. You know, last one. Did your, did your wife talk to you? Did she change your mind? I was supposed to be the second speaker. No, I'm not. I'm not lying. I got two. But then, the, but then the last one said I'm going to be the last one up. I don't know. I guess. I guess we wanted to save the best for last, right? Well, you know, I'm, I'm the man in my house. Okay, I'm the king of my castle. So you're saying, I wear the pants. So you're saying I'm the only potentate. <laughs> Isn't that right there? So Thank you, Brent. <laughs> don't worry about it. I'm just, I'm just messing with you. Oh, and by the way, um, people have heard that I had an operation um, that removed one of my screws um, from my foot. So I'm not as screwy as I might normally be. Um, it, it was only five or six stitches. It's no big thing. It was trying to back out of my skin, so down on my feet there. But Chuck didn't know that. He thinks it's a major operation. It's just about a little, little scar that big, and they just unscrewed the screw because it was coming out on its own. My body was rejecting that foreign material in my foot, and I have one in the other foot, but so far everything's holding together. Um, nothing hurts me. Blind uh, lips are an abomination to the Lord. There you go. <laughs> I love your message, right to the point. <laughs> the Frank Sinatra, that was great. Oh, boy. Let's go to Second Corinthians chapter 3. And, of course, I had the last two verses. Last year he gave me ten and put me up last. Um, anyway, Second uh, Corinthians 3, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such, such hope, we use great plainness of speech. This is one of my favorite verses in the world. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Here's my verses. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the what your words do on the inside of us. They give us that peace and confidence, that knowing, while well, we're here, we're not with you, but absent from the body is to be present with you. We thank you for this comfort. Amen. You know, in my mind, I, I always have ongoing thoughts about gender differences and marriage and things like that, you know. And I was—I didn't see Sam, Chuck's son here. I thought he wasn't going to come because I wanted to impart some wisdom. Um, and it's nothing to be scared about, Sam, you know. Um, tell me if you agree with this. Before marriage, a man yearns, yearns for the woman he loves, right? After marriage, the why becomes silent. Okay, okay, at least I tried. <laughs> now in Scripture, the Word of God is compared to glass. If you go to James chapter 1, look at verses 23 and 24. James chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. James 1, 23. And it says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Now this is in the section of the Bible called the Ages to Come, the Hebrew Epistles. The last nine of epistles of your Bible, they speak of something that's going to happen, it's future from where we are at right now. Um, if you don't understand who you are in Christ today, you don't understand anything, even if you're saved. 
I don't mince any words here. It, it's the problem with most Christians. Most Christians do not want to deal with reality. They go off into La La Land. Debbie and I talk to enough of them seven days a week on the phone. They call all hours. You know, we stop answering the phone after eight o'clock. Now we used to, you know, answer until ten o'clock. No more. But they get they're either stoned or drunk or they they're just really crazy. They're thinking they're not thinking right. They're not thinking re realistically. If you live in this world for any length of time, does your outward man perish? How about your inward man? Is that breaking down too? Sure it is. That's why one of the screws came out. I needed one putting in there because my feet weren't working about the screws. They were breaking down. And just a couple weeks ago, about a month ago, we had a man from West Africa. He's been here a long time. But he's a member of the church and he just signed up for Grace School of the Bible. Now last week he really dropped the bomb on me. And I'm, I'm praying for this man. I hope he, he can stick with the course. He believes in voodoo. Now, Western Africa, he's from Nigeria. Now, he went over there just a few weeks ago, and I was supposed to meet with him one week, and I spent three and a half hours with him on Sunday, and he called before he came because of the big scare of Ebola. He says, I don't have, I'm not contagious and all this. Okay, you know. But he called up, and we met, and I'm, I'm still here. You know, it's been well within the period of, uh, you know, 21 days or whatever it is, but he, he, he just, he thinks his wife is trying to kill him. I go, what do you mean? Well, he said, I saw um, her, she took my piece of meat and gave her me her piece of meat and I think she's poisoning me. I said, wait a minute, wouldn't he, if you, if you died, wouldn't they find that out in the autopsy? No, they'll never see it. What? What are you talking about? He thinks this and he thinks he's under attack and he thinks his wife is trying to kill him. And he's, he's going to grade school the Bible? Is that compatible with the Word of God? Is that superstition? Yeah, it is. Now, can somebody please tell me how I can get him past? Well, I know how to do it if he believes the word. But he's grown up with this. It's ingrained in him. It's ingrained. Before I was saved, speaking of ingrained, Alex, I was proficient in three languages. English, sarcasm, and profanity. No, in that order, right. Alex knows. I asked Steve how old he was when he got saved. He was 17. I was 41. So I'm thinking, boy, I'm glad God isn't great on the curve. You have to pile up your good things and your bad things because I'd be out of the will of God right away, wouldn't I? I mean, it was commonplace for swearing in my house. Deb and I, we know a, a woman... She's about 60 years old. She just started a new job. And she doesn't look her age, but she dyes her hair and all that. And, and she started a new job with Comcast. So there's a big learning curve, especially somebody that age, the electronics and all that. And she came home from that job one day, first couple of days. She says, I can't believe the younger people. They drop the F-bomb everywhere they go. I mean, there's no, the girls and boys, you know, they, they don't think anything of it. So... Here's my opportunity. Now, you got to know my past. I said, you know what? You can be a good witness because if you don't say that, that's what they'll notice. Mm -hmm. And one of the girls, instead of saying the F-bomb, she said, oh, fudge. So she's, she's, you know, beginning to change the people. That, I said, what do you expect when you live in this present evil world? I was part of that evil for 41 years, you know. Please forgive me. You know, thank God for His grace. And she's just... Uh, she, she sees it. She's beginning to see it. Um, the word liberty, in, in the verse there, there's liberty. It means freedom. The context of this passage is the law versus grace. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with that yoke of bondage. Galatians 5.1 What do most people want to do? They want more of the Kool-Aid. They want more of the unrealism. They want more of the fake stuff. They want to get out of their emotional bandwagon and take it down the road and run it for all it's worth. And they always burn out. We're living in reality right now. Your bodies are decaying. The moment you're born, you're on your path to death. 
That's the last experience all of us will have on this planet. And then after that, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's an action verb. We go from this dimension, step right over to the next one. There's no soul sleep. It's a promise from God. The gospel of the grace of God points out the differences between law and grace. Where the law is, there is bondage. It's genders to it. This is contrary to what the Jews believe, who call the law liberty and say, he that studies in the law has freedom from everything. Is that what you experience? Is that what the Bible talks about? It gives freedom to nothing. It binds you with a yoke around your neck and brings on a spirit of bondage. Satan's M.O. He puts a lie out there in plain sight that it's totally contrary to the revealed truth. Just like women do when they want to hide something on their husbands. They put it right in front of his face. Because we walk right past those things, we never see it. That's why we don't like to change the furniture around. It bothers us. It's a genetic thing. So Satan is taking this lie, put it right out there in front of everybody else, and all the Christians are following that lie. They're going by their emotions and their feelings. It has nothing to do with the way God's working today. I mean, I can get worked up by the glory of God, the grace of God, but I'm not going to get, get worked up and whooping and howling and start speaking in a different tongue or something like that. Come on. That's childhood. That's childish. But most of Christianity is there. Even the saved Christians. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, if you don't study and believe the Bible dispensationally, thank God you're saved, but you're out of the will of God. Period. Open face, it says in the book. With open face, beholding as in the glass, the glory of the Lord. Open face means unveiled. Alex used the verse, 2 Corinthians 3.14, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remained the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Open face means unveiled. Don't forget that. Here's what God's Word, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, here's what God's Word teaches about the law. And it teaches us this, just so we as adult sons in the dispensation of grace, we can know the difference between law and grace and which decision to make, where, where, where we should go. First Timothy chapter 1, let me start at verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of the pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside in, unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Is there any man out there that used it lawfully and never was guilty in one point at all? Well, there's one man, right? Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. So what are all these people walking around, calling themselves Christian, screaming all this jumbo out of their mouths and thinking they're righteous, putting themselves back under the law? But the, for the lawless and do, for disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers. You know what men stealer is? Kidnap, make them slaves. For liars and for perjured persons, per persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which is committed to my trust. Now that's what he's saying about the law. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to the end is talking about the law versus grace. The context. Now over here we have about 10, 12 years ago, um, I did a little book, at, uh, it was a paper, called The Benefits of Keeping the Law. And the reason I did this is because I got a phone call from a pastor who had been pastoring for about 30 or 35 years. And he loved the law. He was saved from what he said. And when I got him over to the book of Galatians, that's when he decided to hang up. And I was so frustrated 
I'll put these things together. Now, Galatians has six short chapters. I pulled out 34 points of the benefits of keeping the law. And I'm going to read this quickly. Okay? I'm not the verses. Here's what the law does, does for you. Makes you accursed. It pleases men, not God. It destroys the testimony of the faith of Christ. It brings people under bondage. It takes away their freedom. It does not teach the truth of the gospel. These are all verses now. It carries you away with dissimulation. It does not make you walk uprightly. You make yourself and Jesus ministers of sin. You become a transgressor. You frustrate the grace of God. You become foolish and bewitched. You are under a curse, but you cannot keep the law because you cannot keep the law. You are not justified. It is not a faith. It has absolutely nothing to do with securing eternal life in heaven. It cannot give you righteousness. It keeps you as a child. It does not allow you to grow. You return to the weak and beggarly elements. Paul becomes your enemy. You do not understand the law yourself. You persecute the righteous. Jesus Christ means nothing to you because you have fallen from grace. You are not obeying the present truth. You fulfill the lust of the flesh. You are not led of the Spirit. You are mistakenly, you have a high opinion of yourself. You are deceived and teach deception. You mock God. You sow to the flesh and will reap corruption. Law keepers are show-offs, always desiring to make it fair show in the flesh. Now, how many more words do you need to get the idea across what God's saying about the law today? And if you combine the one I just gave you in First Timothy, that's 56 points on the law, and that's on the end of it. There's many, many other things God has to say about the law. The other extreme, well, there's no rules or responsibility, but grace makes you accountable. Grace lays open your heart. Great God's grace is His provision for you to live freely and successfully for Him. We're not appointed to be successful. We're appointed to be faithful. If you do not understand grace and the dispensation of grace, you, you cannot live. You are not living for God. Am I getting my message across? Okay? Good. You become a walking contradiction. Now, I don't speak this way outside the pulpit, mostly, but I'm here to convince you. I'm trying to convince you. In the Lord's eyes, and you are an absolute traitor to the truth. You, can, you become an ambassador for Satan, and you help the adversary, the devil, the behemoth, whatever you want to call him, the Assyrian, you're helping his cause. He wants to keep lost people lost and save people confused. That's plan B. He, fulfilling plan B. He says in Job 41, He beholdeth all high things. He is the king over all the children of pride. Talking about Satan. Think about something. If you're a Christian and you don't, you never learn how to differentiate between law and grace, what would you like put on your tombstone when you die? Or what should be put on your tombstone? I'll tell you what. Here lies John Doe, a self-made Christian heretic who thought he had the truth. When I, when I meet people like this, there's a verse in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. 15, he's talking about, count that the long-suffering of Paul, and our beloved brother Paul. But there's a verse here, and let me read it to you. 2 Peter 3, 16, talking about Paul. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Now, there's more than one kind of death in the Bible. This is death in their walk. They might be saved, but they wrestle with the truth. When somebody comes along like me, a Titus, and you, you're trying to convince somebody that, you know, law and grace are incompatible, Romans 11, 6, they can't mix. And I say it rather strongly, you're going to get a little wussy face, you're going to get upset with me? What? What are you going to do? You think you're angry with me? No, they're angry with the Word of God, and I know that, so I can stand there and take their abuse for a while. They're angry with the Word of God and what they've been taught and what they believe because they know it's right and the truth hurts. We're supposed to stand up and give it. Go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. This verse... Um, recently has unveiled more and more truth to me personally. Verse 17. 
For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. What does he mean by reigning in life? When people think of reigning, they think of lording over other people. Reigning in life means reigning over yourself. Getting that wisdom, knowledge, and, and, and instruction from God and reigning over yourself. Who's the hardest person to reign over? Yourself. Right? So what does grace allow you to do? Sometimes, not you know 24-7, but sometimes. allows you to reign over yourself. We don't want to control anybody. We want to reign over ourselves so that we don't pop off of somebody or get mad or cuss them out or use profanity. We want to stand fast because we really know what they're angry at. They don't know that they're angry at the Word of God. That's how blind they are. The people, they want to stay blind. Now, when I talk to rabid people that resist the truth, I always ask them, can't you read? I mean, seeing that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, right? The quickest way to a destination is a straight line, not curving around. So, can't you read? I'll read in the pastor in, uh, the passage in First Timothy chapter one. I'll read them in Galatians. You know, I'll read them those thirty-four points from the verses there, and they still get they still you know dig their feet in. They get them, you know they they just can't you read? Here's something I don't want you for, to forget. This is, this is key. In the dispensation of the grace of God, grace is front-loaded, not back-loaded. You understand? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and Colossians 2. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and Colossians 2. Second Timothy chapter one, let me read verse nine. Let's start at verse eight. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. We're partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, if you rightly divide the word of truth. I don't need to say any more. Who hath saved us? And called us, are, are they present tense or past tense verbs? With a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, does this mean that God saves something before they're even born? No. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're saved. You have the grace. Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 13 and 14. And notice the, the tense of the verbs. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened. Not going to be quickened, not quickening. You quickened, made you alive with him, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The verse Alex read. These ordinances were against us. Deuteronomy. What does the word mean? I use this all the time. Yeah, Alex talked about that the second time, right? Well, then how come in Deuteronomy 24, he, where he says, Take this book of the law, put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be used there uh, as a witness against thee. Deuteronomy 32. Doesn't that tie into Romans 3, verses 18, 19, 20? For by the laws of knowledge of sin. You see that connection there? Now, there's a certain pattern. Well, let me go back. Go to Acts chapter 3 and 1 Peter 1. Here's the other side of that. Um, grace being front-loaded and not back-loaded. Acts chapter 3 and then 1 Peter chapter 1. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. Peter says to Israel, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come for the presence of the Lord. Are we waiting for this? Or 2 Timothy 1 says we already have the grace. We don't have to wait. 
We're already quickened. We're already saved. We're already accepted in the beloved. All these things, past tense. Having forgiven you all trespasses, I'm, I'm sorry, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all those holy prophets since the world began. Now the people in this room here know the mystery. Information kept secret since before the foundation of the world. Prophecy is made known since when you open the Bible. First Peter 1.13, he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Grace and the dispensation of grace is front-loaded. These people back here, the Hebrew epistles, Hebrews, by the way, it's written to Hebrews. Got, got another book over there. Did Paul author Hebrews? No, he didn't. Hebrews explains the cross to the people in that time as Romans does to everybody today. So, having this knowledge answers the verse in Acts 15.11 that people mixed up. It says, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we be, shall be saved even as they. This is Peter saying this in Acts. Does that mean they get saved the same way? As, no. Is grace going to save them in the ages to come? Yes. Is the cross made available to them in the ages to come? Yes. It's God's grace. But they have to wait. They have to endure to the end, don't they? It says, our God is a consuming fire. Paul never says that about God today. He said, grace, peace, and mercy, not judgment and war. We behold Christ as in the glass of his word. When Moses was given the law, his face shone, shined. It was because the law was holy, just, and good. Doesn't Romans 7 say that? The hearts of Christians can shine also with the knowledge of God's grace and inward man transformation. Now, I, I get up here and, you know, I tell people all the time, my two biggest fears in life was public speaking and getting married. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm getting a little better in public speaking. Marriage, you know, well, I don't know about that. Um, but uh, I have more to say about that in a moment. Um, I won't. I'm, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> in inward man transformation. What could get a guy like me to stop using profanity out in public? I'm not, I'm not perfect, I know that. But don't you have to hurt somebody first and the verse comes to your mind and you realize you shouldn't have done that? That's what happened to me. But no filthy communication proceed out of your mouth. Isn't that the best way to learn? Brother John and I were talking about, you know, losing it sometimes. You know, if, if you lose it, you get angry, and you, you know, the best witness you can give anybody is to apologize. Or to say, I don't know, but I'll find out for you. Mm -hmm. The best witness. And that keeps the door open for you to get another chance to give them the gospel. Remember, they're not angry at you like they think. They're angry with the Word of God. Don't forget that. And while we're speaking about the law, what does Scripture teach about Israel's keeping of the law? Trying to create their own righteousness. And they can't do it because Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to them. Right. But I mean, if the law is sacred, absolutely mandatory for a relationship with God, how did they do? The more you know the Old Testament, the better ambassador you will be. Because you see over and over and over and over again, God gave me them chance after chance. There's all these wannabe Jews out there. They want to read all the good things, but they throw away all the cursings. But that's, had God chosen any other nation, it would have turned out the same way. Gentiles are called dogs, but you know, they return to the vomit, but it says that about Israel too in 1 Peter. So we all come from Adam. Proverbs chapter, let me read the verses here, 21 verse 3 says, To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to God than sacrifice. Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. This is in the Old Testament, the law, right? Micah chapter 6 verse 8, 
He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Now about 760 years later, Matthew 23, 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith, these ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. John 5, 1. After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. What's wrong with that verse? Can you see anything wrong with that verse? Anybody? After this there was a feast of the Jews. What does Leviticus 23 say? It says the feast of the Lord, right? Did the Jews believe Christ when he came? No, it was their feast. That's why John 7 1 says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because they sought to kill him. Now, if you go to Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, keep in mind, the whole doctrine of Christ crucified and the difference between law and grace is made as plain as human language can make it. Seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Even in newer Bibles. I took my NIV, okay? And I looked up the verses that I use with people on the phone. I've learned a, a series of verses. When people call, I see whether or not they're saved or not. They say, yeah, they're saved. Uh, can you lose it? My, my next question. Well, yeah, I can lose it. Well, that's not right. So I go to these questions. Okay. During the earthly ministry of Christ, did he come for the whole world just from the nation of Israel? Well, the whole world. Well, go to Matthew 10, read verse, verses 5 and 6. Now, my, the end of you have, you can get the same information. Um, he says, I have not sent but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, 24. John 1, 11. He came on his own, his own re received him not. Verse 31, he came to baptize for the nation of Israel. Same thing in NIV. You can no longer be justified by the law of Moses, Acts 13, 39. He opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles, Acts 14, 27. Therefore, being justified by grace, we have peace with God, Romans 5, 1. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace, Romans 6, 14. For the wages of sin is death, right? Romans 6, 23. Romans 11, 6, if it's works, it can't be grace. If it's grace, it can't be works. They equal each other out. Romans 11, 25 through 27. I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Blindness and pride has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all of Israel shall be saved as it is written. Not the same word, but it reads the same way. And even Romans 16, 25, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, if they were reading their Bibles, instead of acting like they're in la-la land all the time, oh, I'm, you know, yeah, I, got, I, I know I've said this a lot, but... You know, one woman called me up and wanted me to pray for her uterus. I go, uterus? You know, I, being a man, I'm picturing some big uterus walking down the street. You know, I get, you know, yeah, I get, whoa, get the attack of the uterus. And I just, you know. So my, if you go to Romans 2, and I read this in, in the NIV, it gives the same sense as what Romans 2 is talking about. Verse 17, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. And knowest his will, and approvest of things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal. Dost thou steal? He's saying, of course you do, you know. Thou that says a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Yeah, they're doing the same thing. Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Now keep in mind, the NIV I have reads the same way. Law keepers have a sickness. You know what myopia is? It's... 
a medical condition in which you cannot clearly see the things that are that are far away. They have spiritual, they are myopic, a lack of foresight or discernment. They're tunnel visioned. That's what they're sick with. They, you, you give them the truth, they, you know, they can't, they can't, how can I explain it? They don't want to know. And it's very few, the 18 years Debbie and I have been answering that phone, and I know I bring this up all the time, but it's, it's, it's in my head all the time. Most of the people don't want to believe it. Very few people will come to the truth of this and open up to that. And when you get that, you want to strike the band and start marching around, you know, spend three hours on the phone with the person, you know, giving them all the Bible in three hours, you know, anything you can give them. But most of the people don't do that. So what we get a lot is people who are angry or people who are in la-la land or people who want you to pray for the uterus or to fill up their gas tank. What kind of thinking is that? Is that adult thinking? No, it's not. If you do not understand who you are in the eyes of God, how can you function as who you are, the way God would want you to function? Example, about three weeks ago I had a woman call up in the evening. She was listening to one of Rick's messages. Now Rick just loves this when they call me and they get angry at me. I take that off of him, so that's okay. I've been married long enough, I know that. Um, he was talking about the two natures we have. Now, do we have two natures? We got old man, old man, new man, right? And they're always conflicting. She said, "I cannot believe we have two natures. If God can't make me righteous right here in my flesh, I'm not going to believe him." She thinks God made her righteous. The point is, she thinks she doesn't have any conflict. But on the phone, who was she having a conflict with? <laughs> Me. She couldn't see it. I said, that's not what Scripture says. It says, put off the old, put on the new. Walk in the newness of life. Study to show yourself approved. Right? Grow in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Make full proof of thy ministry. But you're always going to have the fight. Did the Apostle Paul, did he ever lose the fight? Did he always have that fight in his flesh? Sure he did. And he was up in heaven, wasn't he? The third heaven. I've been on this passage for a long time. He went up there in 2 Corinthians 12, and he heard words that he couldn't speak. They were unlawful for him to speak. He couldn't come down here and tell us those words. How are we edified today? Through the Word of God. I think when we go to be with the Lord, we're going to hear those words. It's going to explain everything. And we'll know that. But not until that time. Not until that time. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where He is as a Spirit of illumination, there is freedom from former blindness and darkness. Where He is as a Spirit of regeneration and sanctification, freedom from bondage of sin and satanic captivity. Where He is as a comforter, there is freedom from the fear of hell, wrath and damnation. Where He is as a Spirit of prayer and supplication, there is liberty of access to God with boldness. Where He is as a Spirit of adoption, there is the freedom of children as with a father and the ability to become an adult. Ephesians 2.15, heaven abolishing his flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make himself a twain, one new man, not child, so making peace. Paul says in, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness wherein they lie in wait to deceive. Does the law give you liberty? No. It has dominion over you. It curses you. It puts you in bondage. Second Corinthians 124. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. When you want to control somebody, remember the reigning? You're having dominion over their faith. God tells us to reign in life, not him, us, individually. Take the knowledge you have and extract any wisdom, knowledge, and education you have to get others saved, to help mankind. Not, not to kill them, not to hurt them, but to do some good. Because his desire is to have all men to be saved. All right? 
Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. So, can you read? Are these words that you, you can read in your NIVs? Sure they are. Go to Romans chapter 10. Does the law make you happy? <coughs> According to Scripture. Let me read this passage again. Let's start at verse 1. Paul says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they had a zeal of God, have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now look at how many times he repeats a certain word. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. What part of Romans 10, 1 through 4 can't you read? What part of Romans 10, 1 through 4 don't you understand? Please, I'm pleading with you. I feel like I'm begging you, open up your mind. I'm not trying to do you wrong here. What part don't you understand? What don't you understand about the law and right? You can't get righteousness by keeping the law. How many verses, how many words do you need to hear before it's going to sink in? You're going to open up to the truth. And then it becomes a new book. When Moses came down from the mountain, his face shone, right? And they were afraid to come nigh unto him. The law is holy, just, and good if it's used law lawfully. But James 2 says if you're guilty in one point, you're guilty of all. Hebrews 2, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. There's a great verse in 1 John 4.18. Let me read it to you. There's no fear in love, but purpose love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. What does Paul say to that? 2 Timothy 1 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you a couple more examples. And my people from Indiana know I getting a lot of mileage out of this. Um, recently, I was threatened two different times. One guy came to our church one day. He was there um, first time. He talked a lot about himself. Second time, the next Sunday he was there, and I heard him talking to somebody that he has the power to spiritually cleanse houses and spiritually cast demons out of people. I said, we don't believe that. That's nonsense. So I got up to preach, and I, I thought I preached him out. But guess who was waiting for me next Sunday? This loon. Not this guy. And I tried talking to him again. He, he wouldn't believe it. I tried showing him the chart. By the way, this is real interesting. You have this complicated chart here that people un, can't see on the video. It's complicated to most Christians. And you have that up above there. I just, and I'm small enough that you can see the whole thing. It just, this doesn't work. <laughs> So he says, you know, I'm going to pray for an avenging angel to come down here and to destroy your assembly. Debbie and I just bought a new vehicle. Three flat tires. I know about one of them, but the other two could have been that avenging angel himself. You know, I asked the hotel where we had, if you have cameras going, but I couldn't find anything out. Then there was this guy who had my wife on the phone two days, was just driving her nuts. Says, Give me that phone. What do you want? <laughs> He's telling her, but you know, I'm, I'm the only one that, that preaches God, that serves God rightly, and all that, you know, and, and I'm the one, only one out there that doesn't get any money for doing this. Well, I mean, are we all rolling in dough here? You know, come on. And then he brings up this thing about, uh, I, I haven't had sex in 20 years. I'm thinking, what are you bringing up that topic for? How does that fit in? 
I, it bothers me to watch those commercials with the naked women. Well, turn off the TV. <laughs> so I said to the guy, I said, next time you call, you're talking to me, not Debbie. He didn't know she was my wife. Click. So he calls up again. And he's angry. I said, you know what? You are a heretic and a pervert. Now, he perverted the word of God, did he not? He was told more than once. All she was trying to do was trying to see if he was saved. All he wanted to do was wanted to brag him on himself and what else he wanted to get get through. So he called me up the next day. It was, it was, I'm, I'm glad he lives in, in, in Florida. And he says, you don't have the right to live. You have to die. <laughs> now I'm going to make sure that happens. Those things, you know, these guys don't scare me, you know. I know about threatening behavior. I've been married 38 years. <laughs> Remember those mood rings? You wear a ring in the color of something? I bought my wife one of those. And when she was in a good mood, the stone would turn a very pretty blue. But when she wasn't, it left a big red mark on my forehead. <laughs> There's four institutions God created. Marriage, um, um, volition is free will, marriage, family, and government. God played a trick on us. Marriage is an institution, all right, but it's an institution where Two people come together to jointly solve problems they didn't have before. <laughs> so, uh, I'll stop. If you go to Second Corinthians chapter four, Second Corinthians four. And where are you going there? I'll, let me read you Romans three three. For what have said some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Are they going to bother me because they think they're God's conduit, they're, they're God's henchmen down here, they can do the will of God? It's not going to bother me at all. You know, God, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 4 through 6, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Romans says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... We faint not. The ultimate goal of the Holy Spirit is a spiritual inner transformation of a man and woman. The law demanded righteousness. The gospel of grace provides righteousness. If you do not know who you are, you cannot function properly. I use my DI voice if I have to. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Is that possible according to Scripture? We have something that exceeded the law. It says the law is just and holy and good. We have something that went way beyond that. How did Jesus Christ find liberty when he was down here? By doing the will of his Father. How do we find liberty while we're down here? By doing his will. We're no longer children held by the hand, told what to do. It says, quit ye like men, study, grow. And take that in you, work it in you with your personality, Timothy or Titus, and you work it out for the goodness of God. Go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The liberty of the new man is simply the liberty to do the will of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 
Verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Here's our reward. Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So when you want to have dominion over somebody, when you want to put them under the law, you're charging that person. That's wrong. Those who live under the law today have a self-imposed veil upon their hearts. And I say that self-imposed because there's enough words in their book, if they read it, instead of just listening to the TV, or the radio and watching the TV, or going to these, these, these Benny Hinn concerts or whatever, you know, there's enough words. If they just sat down, even in their NIVs, they could read this, they could pull this out. If they studied, they show themselves approved unto God. It is the duty of the ministers of the gospel of grace to use great plainness or clearness of speech. As I said before, a self-imposed veil on your heart. It's like saying to people, carbs and sugar are great. Go out and stock up and just move them down. People who want to put you on the law, they want to, they want to control you. They want to have dominion over your faith. couple other things. In talking about the Old Covenant and New Covenant. You know how Hebrews said, says, for a testament isn't in effect until after the death of the testator? What John said this morning, I, I agree with. Does it ever say a covenant isn't in effect until after the death of the covenator? Does it? I think of Arnold, you know, I'm the governor, you know, the strong man, you know. I'm going to terminate you, yeah? The governor. There's no such word in there. Just like reconciliation and atonement are the same Greek word, so is testament and covenant, but there's a different meaning. Plus, they're spelled differently. That goes all the way back to Genesis 3. All the way back where Abel realized the proper sacrifice was the blood sacrifice. Got the first and second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ before the law. First time they use the word testimony in the word of God is Ezekiel 16, uh, Exodus 16.34. It's capitalized. It's not the first word of the sentence. So it's a testimony capitalized. It's referring to Jesus Christ. His testimony is that everybody wants to be in heaven. Faith in the promise is interdispensational. The promise always being eternal life. So before the law was given, the testimony, capital T, runs all the way through the Bible. Faith in the promise. Interdispensational. So yeah, when Paul comes along, they talk about the cross in Isaiah 53. Nobody knew it. The twelve didn't know it when Jesus Christ showed up. The, 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 uh, Peter didn't know it in Acts chapter 2, the good news of it. But you come to Romans 3, Paul knows it. Here's the good news of the blood. Now we have the full, the complete picture, don't we? Except Israel isn't where she's supposed to be yet, neither are we. We're supposed to be up in heaven, and they have that tribulation to go through. So, death is the last earthly experience all of us will have. It's just a boundary line that we're going to cross over. Life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the quicker it goes. Okay? I didn't know if that was going to be a joke or not. I meant it as doctrine. You know what you're going to think of the next time you go into Bethlehem, don't you? There's a point where none man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. And fear not them which kill the body, but not, cannot kill the soul, but rather for him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The Holy Spirit transforms your mind by giving you a new day, way of thinking. The Holy Spirit creates the mind, the heart, and the attitude of Christ within you. What produces this new creature? The preaching of the cross. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. And the comfort that you give us 
and the love that you've shown us. Pray this in your son's name. Amen.